If you want to see the evolution of a great vivarium, where one tadpole is transformed into a massive toad, or where salamanders come together and mate, or ant colonies live side by side in peace, or slime molds breathe, or small acorn ants forage, and so much more, this video is for you, because this vivarium is now not aged in months, but years. Make sure to watch until the end as well as I will announce the introduction of in my opinion Europe's coolest ant species into this vivarium. This video will be a documentary mainly mixed with previous content from already posted vivarium updates but also new content of newer events that have happened in the latest months. So sit back, relax and watch until the end as I'm putting you through its entire history starting from scratch. And what better way to start than with this footage from some months ago. Now this vivarium was at a point of population dense insanity, it was like Bangladesh. But this was far from the reality of the tank before this. And in fact before any of these lands were inhabited, the future real estate holders at this vivarium actually lived elsewhere, such as in this small vivarium. Here you can see a bristle tail. It looks so lonely at this point, but just wait. I will add this species to the food web sketch I am working on for this video as well, as you can see. You will see it throughout the video. But fun fact, these animals are also super ancient, cousins to the first vertebrates to ever conquer land. They do look a lot like silverfish. I hope my identification skills are right because or else my house will be in trouble. But anyways, moving on to the most important inhabitant of this vivarium, the European fire ants. This was one of many ant colonies that were going to be introduced to this vivarium. Here you can see a part of their colony. Most eggs and queens were underground at this point, but you can see some winged princes and princesses. Except for having a nasty little bite that I always get reminded of in the most painful way ever, these hunting lads I believe would probably constitute the largest ant colony of the tank. Having heard of their aggression though, in nature, I examined their compatibility living next to other colonies, hence making them live near a colony of Lassius Flavus that I had, which to my surprise worked out just fine. You know what? Let's add them to this food web. Next we had two scorpions that were both warming up to the vivarium. Some might say that this mealworm is too big for my boy here, but let me tell you that firstly he was totally free to ignore the worm, and second, that if you are about to be introduced to my vivarium, splendid lush vivarium I would say, you can't be no weakling. So big up for grabbing, stabilizing and paralyzing your prey, Mr. Scorpion. Oh look at that stinger. <laughs> The next resident was a hard one to prepare though. I had to make a socially parasitic ant queen accepted by her slave workers. If you want to know more about this very intricate process, just check the video links above. It is really fascinating, basically two ant species living together. But I succeeded and now we had a very cool starting colony of Lassius umbratus in its preliminary colony founding stage. Also as a total segue, the Myrmica rubra ants were hunting worms even underground this entire time. No worm was going to be safe in my future vivarium if I introduced them. Hell yeah. Next I prepared another vivarium for two other future inhabitants. It was so epic. Well, I guess not, but mind you, these two salamanders apparently grow like I don't know what. I remember how we were all, oh look how cute they are, but now they have grown even more than both the Tesla and Bitcoin market value this year combined. No real profit was made from my investment though, but I know if it happened it would have been dinosauristic. So let's begin with the tank related stuff now, because all these animals are not really living together so far. And yes, of course I added the salamander to the food web. What do you expect? Well, even if this looks difficult, this part of the vivarium process is actually the easiest. Placing the false bottom, draining the water, substrate divider that separates it from the dirt above, and decorating the vivarium requires much less intellectual brain power compared 
to designing the future ecosystem that will preside in it and thrive. Also, before the epic waterfall was achieved, this was the waterfall. I know, I know, but at least it had some shrooms or mushrooms, I mean. Just look, some of the first here, but for sure not the last. Keep watching to see this guy later. But cooler even, a la cucaracha, was that the vivarium was now starting to become alive with all the animals that got into it, with the dirt and the plants that I put in there. Have a look. So there you go, you have gotten all these species and... Oh, okay, it's not done yet. Ah, alright. Well, go on then. Oh really? Oh, that damn woodlouse. I will make sure to never listen to him again. Well, as you can see, there was already a pre-existing diversity of organisms before I decided to introduce the other animals that I've shown you before. We then have a diagram looking like this. Most of them are not in yet, but we for sure will get them in there, so no worries. The animals inside started to really settle in, just like Marvin here, that each morning got up just like a cow <laughs> and ate moss. Having a reoccurring insect like this in a big vivarium, like this one, is a really rare occasion and I have appreciated every moment with him. Just see him there. And obviously, the other beetle-looking creatures inside were at a minimum just as entertaining to observe. They really looked like small dark tanks with random activities running around, except that they can fly, and some ungrateful fellows that even tried to escape, which I let them do, of course. Oh. Then we had this enormous guy, a massive beast. <laughs> These guys are nocturnal and definitely have the most legs in the vivarium. I never saw this one again actually. It's probably feasting underground or got eaten by something. You never know in a vivarium. Same goes for this little guy as well. This fella, however, is missing some extra legs if it's ever going to keep up with the leg competitions. For an eating competition, however, it might not be that much of a problem. The vivarium, as you may have noticed, uh, hosts a terrestrial and an aquatic part with a huge trunk hugging these lands from above and behind. I was not very proactive during these times and let the vivarium do its thing, except maybe adding a piece of ham here and there, such as this one. During this vivarium phase, there was an extreme case of an increase in fly population. Not quite like Bangladesh, maybe Germany? <laughs> Why not Heinrichland? As you can see, these woodlice 
seem to be living surrounded by a lot of buzzing friends, even when settling disputes between them. I suspect this was because all of the dead leaves I put in from outside had brought a lot of new eggs inside with them, and the flies just closed. But what did this increase in fly population entail, you might guess? Well. You might have guessed right, spiders! Oh come on, these spiders are actually quite cute. Look at this guy. Oh, lucky I do not have that guy inside my vivarium at all. Despacito. Oh. Well, as you can see, there were more spider webs now. Even though I didn't film it all in one go, then, for some reason, the entire forest floor was teeming with spider webs. But this was actually expected, as I also actually predicted that they would soon start to die out as well. Why? Well, because of this. The predatory prey model is a natural phenomenon that assumes that the prey consumption rate by a predator is directly proportional to the prey abundance. This means that predator feeding is limited by only the amount of the prey in the environment. And since they live in a natural environment, this is exactly what would happen. And with the time, the spider population actually dropped. I really do not know what I was supposed to put as a video here, but yeah. But do you want to know something that made my jaw drop? Well, a bloody Camponotus and queen made it into my vivarium somehow. And she was crazy, foraging like nothing else mattered. A perfect hiding spot for her fat abdomen, she would own it. Running down a 90 degree hill in lightning speed, she would do it. Feasting on honey in a dangerous spot, well, what do you think? Ah yes, a completely normal natural scene. A pill bug, some other animals such as that guy with the antenna there, and a freaking ant queen having a supper together. It was rather quite insulting that this unnatural behavior was happening inside my vivarium that was supposed to be natural. Anyways, where did she even come from? Well, all I had to do was wait and follow her trail. And look at that. She had apparently come from a large trunk, well the large trunk that I had moved into the vivarium. She just barely made it into the hole. How amazing is this? I had not even introduced any of my ant colonies yet, and this was happening. Okay, okay, I'll get off. Don't worry about it. So as you can see, there was a lot of life that I was ready for, but had not prepared in a controlled way. But anyhow, this was now the end of the laying back and observing stage. I decided to become more proactive. It was time. Time for this beauty to get pushed into the right direction. And what better way to secure this future of a sexy landscape biodiverse vivarium, but with a sexy waterfall. I had gone to the shop and gotten the greatest pump they had, and oh boy, it could really pump some water. This was important, as the running water could not only create a very cool additional structure in the vivarium, but also allow more water to evaporate, increasing the humidity around it, providing a very attractive macro microclimate for a lot of bugs. But even though the pond below hadn't been decorated yet, there was already movement down there. This amphibian isopod was just cruising around. You can also see it has some sort of air pocket around it, and it does make sense since all isopods were originally aquatic, being crustaceans. They require moisture to breathe, just like moss do for all the plants. And could you imagine that all the plants were the insects then? That's how they connect to each other evolutionarily? I don't know if that makes sense to you, but it hopefully does for the biologists out there. These guys even go back and moisturize their bums or something. Have a look at this. Probably moisturizes their gills or lungs. I also saw a small spider underwater, which is weird. Who are you even? Oh. Makes sense. Anyways, finally time to introduce the salamanders. The waterfall, pond and main structures of the vivarium were all ready for them. These fire salamanders are very special, and some can even live up to 50 years, which is probably due to that they hibernate many months during the winter. I don't really know how long they hibernate, but this paper said some months, and at least I think 
that must be approximate. Uh, they are mostly nocturnal, but I might be lucky enough to see them head out when I generate some artificial rainfall. They eat various bugs, such as mealworms, spiders and slugs. That we all have in this vivarium, perfect for two hungry little beasts. Additionally, they even consume newts and young frogs. As said before, they grow quite a bit, up to 25 centimeters. We will see how big our guys end up as, so make sure to watch to the end of the video. Their introduction was interesting, as they both climbed the waterfall peacefully until one of them totally dove right into the tube, pumping the water, which freaked me out. Luckily enough, I managed to get him out, without any problems. And then, I salamander proofed the tube, obviously. It was a good thing, I observed them after introducing them, and it was all chill. We love you, you're very special, but go home and go home in peace. Okay, so back to the isopods. Some of them couldn't swim unfortunately, and I could often fish them up from the pond. And what I did, since there were no aquatic animals inside yet, was to put them back to the terrestrial part for other terrestrial animals to scavenge on them, as you can see here. But how are the isopods doing then, you might ask, since you see them drown all the time? Well, let me tell you, there's something else they're drowning in. And yeah. Alright, thank you for this educative part, Mr. Isopod. Continuing, I also even found an albino isopod one night, which is crazy rare from what I know. Predators are obviously needed to tackle these small, multi-legged little tanky bugs. Maybe the centipedes could, but I'm not convinced by it. So here goes the introduction of the scorpions. May they eat isopods from dusk till dawn, or just around the clock, I don't know. Well, the introduction went smoothly. No remarkable things happened, and I simply tried not to get stung and killed by them. I genuinely expected them to contribute to the control of the isopod populations, but then I saw that my scorpion only eats five isopods a year to keep themselves happy. So, as the madman as I am, I decided to introduce the fire ant colony just after. They resided in an old vivarium presented before, and I managed to carefully dig out all the dirt except the one circumventing their colony. I was pretty happy with the results, allowing me to carefully scoop all of them, including some soil, into the vivarium. Inside, they seemed rather calm, considering the fact that their entire nest was upside down. I really hoped their queen was fine and well inside. Soon, they also formed columns and trails, just like most other organized ants in nature including temporary tunnels leading to their future nest. However, the isopods and I were starting to wonder how they would interact on an interspecies level with other organisms in the tank, as I carefully observed any interaction I could see. Moving on, having a look at the soil, it was really starting to take shape, as it was filled with various organisms. Mostly microorganisms. Just have a look here. Just have a look here. Sometimes it even got crowded for the larger subterranean organisms, such as this humongous worm. Some earthworms looked super weird though. If anybody has any idea, please let me know. I'm very curious. Look at this yellow one. What? But do you know what else is a subterranean organism? the Lassius Umbratus colony. The queen and her slaves were all ready. For some weird reason, I was quite anxious when introducing them into the vivarium. Maybe it was because there were a lot of flies and other stuff flying around. 
Also, I knew that once I introduced them, I would probably never see them again because, you know, they rarely surface and I would probably miss them quite a lot. As I said, they are subterranean, but hopefully they will, you know, dig by the glass and that kind of stuff. But interestingly, there seem to be some interspecies bullying by slave maker workers and slave workers when they were examining some honey I put forward for them. Really strange. Because they seemed very cordial in the test tube. Hmm. I hope that ant makes it. Nevertheless, they kept on moving out throughout the entire night and ended up moving entirely out within two days. Tunnels, through the soil, and for some reason all the way down to the false bottom. Where they enjoyed the very moist environment there. Two ant colonies in and it was now time for the third to go. This is an ant colony introduction fiesta. All getting ready to take over this amazing free real estate also known as the vivarium. I tried to lure them out with some honey but they seemed rather unbothered overall by the surroundings and all the organisms teeming in it. They refused to move out during an entire week which is really not optimal as they are very vulnerable in their test tubes, exposed to the light and everything that inhabits the vivarium. I therefore transported the tubes underground where they could chill in their beloved test tubes for a longer time unharmed. I really hope my large vivarium has a suitable nest for them somewhere at least. But as I was checking the tubes again, the crazy ant queen was present there, dangerously close actually. Then she started to try to force her way into their nest. This could only end in one way as she would end up killed by the other ant colony. But for the moment being the ants inside the tube seemed scared of the insane ferocity of the crazy ant. <laughs> Dead unfortunately the legacy of the Camponotus herculeanus species in the vivarium was extinguished. Surprisingly, she was not eaten by the harassed ant colony and they simply disposed her outside their nest. Whereafter I picked her up and did the natural burial ceremony of the vivarium, giving her back with her organic compounds in a presentable way for the rest of the vivarium to feast on. Hey hey, don't be sad. As one life is gone, others shall be made. Especially since everything in this vivarium gets eaten. Look at this earthworm consuming some leaves. It's fascinating how every organism has its integral role for the sustainability of the ecosystem. The most ambitious eaters in the vivarium, however, were the slugs. But everything is in the eye of the beholder, actually, because some might hint to the fact that the most ambitious eater in the vivarium is not a slug, but the predator of it. Here is an incredible video I will show you guys that really confirms the who is the apex predator of the tank. Some might think it's the scorpions, but no no, wait to see what happens. So you know, just chilling, eating some worm, what could possibly happen? Well once again you will see. Look at this action movie, I just love it. It may have escaped death, but again, just like that, the salamander had eaten a good part of one of the slugs. It's not an easy meal though, I mean, the slug is very slimy, 
but I have seen the salamander slowly open its jaw every time it eats a slug. Must be a natural thing, but it looks a bit weird. <laughs> Look, all predators need to track, hunt and eat to live a normal life, and the vivarium is where they can do so, it's a natural environment. Take the spiders as an example. Look at this one, he is waiting in the waterfall for drowning bugs, what an epic strategy. It's just marvelous to observe and just if you let them behave naturally. But more epic than this, actually, is that the Myrmica rubra colony is also starting to hunt and eat wood lice. That is what we like to see, my man. Helping to control the population of them because damn, they are booming at this moment. Other organisms such as these red mites were also foraging for food, but they were not predatory. Not even a millimeter long at times, these clover mites feeds on plants such as grass and, as you might have guessed, clover. Other organisms are more opportunistic though, where I feed them different gifts from above, irregularly, over time. Just as could happen in nature-ish, you know, with a dead animal dying, etc. But others would be opportunistic about the opportunistic organisms as well as this little spider. Truly marvelous to see. The ants were often present, but less excited than what I usually would expect. I figured they were rather looking for aphids and nearby mealybugs to tend for their sugar-like secretions. A reliable food source, as I have seen them forage for them in the vivarium. Both species really had a sweet spot for sugar though. Here you can see both species drinking honey next to each other. Anyhow, the external offerings were often eaten within days and the bioactivity started to boom even more. Just look at this bioactive soil again. By stuff disappearing overnight, I meant it. You're gonna see in this time lapse how the worms were on it, the slugs were on it and a smattering of other small organisms that just could not let any trace of this cucumber to be left behind. Followingly, I noticed the slugs were up to something, as they were not doing, you know, the eat, sleep, repeat thing anymore. I really could not figure out what, especially since they were climbing the trees around the tank. But the answer was that they had started mating. Apparently, they make their way up in trees, curl around, and ramp up their release of slime into a slimy rope that they hang from. Then. When the slime dries, it looks like this. Pretty cool if you ask me. Where the babies are, however, I have no idea. But I put back the slime in the vivarium. Everything serves a purpose. Maybe there is an organism especially keen on dried slug slime in the vivarium. Who knows? Back to the spiders. The predators now took more advantage of this blooming state of the vivarium, such as this gracious spider overlooking its web.
The spiders made these webs in incredible speed, as you can see in this slow-mo of a time-lapse in this video. But web management was even more important for these spiders, as even though they often managed to catch prey, their webs would often be destroyed by other larger individuals. So look at this spider. He caught a fly. Well, you know, happy faces, happy times and everything. But you will see what happens later on. Guess by who this web will get destroyed. Rawr, yeah, <laughs> as some of you might have guessed, the salamander. But that never hindered the spider from trying to spin its web again and again. It must be a real hotspot because in this time lapse you can see it spin its web multiple times after having it destroyed multiple times as well. Personally, I was not complaining about the webs. It was a real pleasure to see them clearly after some artificial rain. They are very aesthetic. Lacking in the shadows was yet another previously introduced predator, the scorpion. And my god, these guys were elusive. I have in total only seen them maybe three times during their entire stay in the vivarium. Incredible. But I was very grateful for each occasion. It was mesmerizing each time and once was even during the day. I find these to be really rare because they normally not do this naturally. So what would the reason be for a scorpion to exit during the day? I have no idea. The next ant to be introduced was the harvester ant colony. These are cool ants that are very organized. Here you can see their trash disposal, for example. And they also collect a lot of grains, because their main diet is made up of them. And they need a very dry environment. Their introduction was swift, but also not without any complications. But well introduced, it was very satisfying to see them forage in their new home. I will let you enjoy it for a bit. It also didn't take long for them to start digging, making a hole in the ground below, straight next to their test tubes. I was really not sure about how well these guys would do in this vivarium, to be honest. They are by far the species inside that needs the driest environment, and I am far from certain that it will be assured for them. Temperature-wise, they should be set, however, and their alimentation in the form of seeds will be provided as external gifts to make sure they never lack them. But I guess we will see. Another worry though, was that according to my judgments, the greatest potential ant-to-ant -ant colony friction in the vivarium was between the Messer and the Myrmica colony. Both would rarely compete for food since they have very different diets as you can clearly see in this video, but they were still quite territorial, omnipresent and similar sized. So far, nothing bad has happened concerning this, except one recorded fight between two workers. I really hope this was a rare happening. I'm not really sure about what happened, but both ants seem hurt or dead, indicating a fight and not just one ant scavenging on another already dead worker. Ant colonies should not always fight, but 
In nature, I'm sure that some ant colony confrontation helps not only to keep the ant colonies on their toes, but also control their population so that they don't overtake the ecosystem, which would indirectly be as bad for all organisms involved. But yes, the tank was now full of ants. Hopefully, they would all mature into balanced colonies in a natural setup. But in this setup, you can only set the scene and the decorations, but you can never completely write the entire script. Such as this guy. He was not planned, and he's the weirdest character in the vivarium. <laughs> Anyways, fast forwarding a bit now, different species started to become more and more omnipresent in the tank. As you can see here, the plants are experiencing massive growth. The ants also grew in number, as I could see them gathering in greater numbers for food. Or that they simply became more common. Not only them though, as that large fat grey dude in this video, the pill bug, he and his kin were multiplying greatly, even though they were heavily predated upon. They eat everything, even rotting wood. Worms were also starting to blow up in numbers, eating anything they could get their hands on, or, well, they don't have a hands, but you get what I'm saying. Obviously, if the isopods hadn't been there before them. And the salamanders were hunting but they were already super occupied with their reproducing slugs that, by the way, were also increasing in number. I could also see how certain larger slugs had marks from salamanders, hurting them. Watch this gracious slug's hind part and you can see the remains of a salamander bite. The result of this was more salamander poop. A really well-made turd. But let's not get segued here. There was obviously the need for a ferocious eater. And soon, because I knew this was not a sustainable state the vivarium was in, soon the plants were going to get eaten alive. But I knew exactly who to call. And no, n unfortunately not Ghostbusters, I'm sorry, but I meant one of these little tadpoles here. Because I knew, if successful, they could grow into a large, ferocious, isopod-eating machine. I decided to make a small aquatic mix of animals that were now finally supposed to inhabit the aquatic compartment of the vivarium. I even decided to add some mini fish. Here they are the day after introduction in a very muddy state of the aquatic pond. Now, after a while, it didn't take long for the tadpole to grow some legs and turn into a small little froggy looking guy. I really grew fond of him, but all of a sudden, he disappeared, and I was only left with the rest of the aquatic inhabitants.
It was very frustrating since I needed a full grown damn toad to rinse the place from the minions of destruction that were multiplying within. Have a look at this time lapse for example. But if you remain observant of this time lapse, you might be able to see something else than isopods and other bugs like it. There, you see? The small but now larger toad is back. It has been hiding inside and feasting all along. This is excellent news. Keep on eating, my friend. Also, I've just got to add that since in order to succeed, this guy needed both a healthy aquatic and healthy terrestrial habitat, I consider this vivarium a great success so far. I mean, wouldn't you? The toad was now a reoccurring feature in most time lapses at this point. But what you may be wondering is what this great snake swirling around is. See how many times you can catch it during this time lapse. Huh, bottom line, this is a very active little fella. And it's a slow worm that was given to me by Ant Scandinavia, a great lad with a great ant channel. It hunts very well in the vivarium and I planned on releasing it back to nature after having observed it for a while. Most of the time I was simply awing at the gracious way of mov moving it had, you know, locomotion. Unsurprisingly though, the slow worm was also enjoying some time in the rotting logs next to the glass, a hotspot for many of the larger animals inside. Even the fire ants seemed to nest in a rotting birch log there. It was really a biodiversity hotspot. The Avenger-like assemblement of predators inside for sure caused the isopod population to drop healthily into a more moderate level. Here is one isopod seeking some refuge by the pond. But who knows, even the pond might not be safe anymore. As if we take a dive down, you can see that the fish have grown more and more. They have, without any help from me, managed to feed on the dead organisms that drown in the pond. Quite effectively, and it's always interesting to see how they interact, as I could clearly see a hierarchical pattern forming between them, 
where the largest fish always got the last say and most of the food. The pond was, however, much more lively and it was always a pleasure to sit there and observe what the aquatic beasts were up to. I have also not included other aquatic organisms into the food web for now, since it would overcomplicate the matter, even though one could argue that they are heavily reliant on the terrestrial and aquatic relationship. However, Mr. Toad, as a now important terrestrial being, is included in the food web. Look how big he has become. It's like a small meatball potato. Okay, so now we're doing some time traveling here. So the time goes and the toad grows larger and larger. And after a while, all the isopods and this life in the in the soil has starting to disappear and it's all because of this isopod eating machine the toad that grows larger and larger i mean as i place my external offerings he simply came and ate all the bugs that dared to venture nearby as you see this toad might have been too much especially compared to before this was a dramatic change him reaching that size without me feeding him even once in the vivarium must be because of the consumption of an unimaginable amount of worms and pill bugs. So I made a decision. I decided to release him back from where he came from, as a full adult. I mean, since he grew up in a vivarium without any assistance, I hope this will be fine for him. See you man, I'm gonna miss him a lot. Even though he caused trouble, I remembered him. He sometimes blocked the waterfall with his enormous stomach. Or he just swam a little bit in the pond. Or sometimes he just chilled in different ways all over the vivarium. Sometimes it was a bit weird though, because I really thought he was stuck. I'm so bad at narrating stuff like this, but it's just insane, you know, how you took a tadpole with a chance of survival close to zero and made it turn into this magnificent beast of a toad within your own vivarium. Seeing every step of the way, except, you know, at some point when it escaped and I didn't see it for a while, but you get what I mean. Anyhow, before we had the summer, when the toad was released, there was the winter. I need to go back a little bit now. This is the season when everything in the vivarium is decaying and the decomposers are having a feast. Both these two guys, the salamander here and the slow worm there, were also having a feast. They often banded together and even though the salamander eats earthworms that might look like the slow worm, they were never aggressive against each other. And to celebrate this, I thought I would present you with a small montage, because they were so active during this time. Well, the montage will be them hunting and eating. Let's go.
This is actually a blooper. Wait, uh, let's change the music. I shall for sure not forget to mention that during the foggy hours of the spring, the sexy time meter of the vivarium had been turned up. The two salamanders had started mating. I mean, I have no idea how they get it done, but it sure seems like they are going for it ferociously. In love. What great luck that, you know, the only potential mate they had in the vivarium works for them. They both also had no mercy for either me or Mr. Toad when it came to publicly display their manifested love. Mr. Toad had not been released yet, but gosh, I think he wished he had been there. Ah, oh, once again my vivarium was showcasing some zoological pornography. What would a Nordic Ants video be without it? Also another thing Nordic Ants videos are semi known for is showcasing organisms we had no idea about such as this fascinating slime mold. I mean, look at it. It looks like an alien organism from another solar system in a galaxy far, far away. Far it shall be. Formerly classified as fungi, mushrooms and more, slime molds are currently defined as eukaryotic organisms that can live freely as a single cell, but that can come together to form reproductive structures, such as the one you're seeing being formed right now. Interestingly, these structures apparently attract a lot of organisms that can feed on them, even ants. I am unaware how though, but you know, they seem interested. I did see the slow worm swirling around it though, always a pleasure. After a while the structure started to change, drying up and turning into a more rigid structure. It was really interesting to see, I wonder what stage the spores are released, if any are. Um, but I managed to get the entire cycle of another specimen further back in the tank on a single time lapse, which I will show to you here. Finally, the last ant colony introduction of the tank in this video. This introduction involved a leptothorax colony. These guys are almost the smallest ants out there, also known as acorn ants with the temnothorax genera. 
This is because literally their entire colony can fit into one single acorn. During their time in the vivarium, I've mostly observed them wandering through the forest floor of the vivarium, foraging for food. I seldom see them going for any honey that I place though. This is however also true for many other ant species from the various ant colonies in the vivarium. But all of them also like honey, and they survive and respect each other, living side to side in this lush habitat, which is mind-boggling. It seems at least as if all the ant colonies in the vivarium at this point has managed to survive in harmony. But that may change in the future, so make sure to subscribe and stay tuned for future updates. I will end this video with some small footage of a mini ant queen that I found in the vivarium, just like that. And you will see that after a while she will find a small spot to found her colony. But guys, take care, be safe, and make sure to stay tuned to the next video, as it will include door-headed ants, and who knows, maybe in this vivarium.